up there. So they're going to open this up and be able to move over to the other view. Oh, great. So you can move back. Yeah, there will be more. Okay, great. So this is a movable wall. I'm going to get this stuff. This is quite the crowd. It usually looks like a mixed adult. Buongiorno, buongiorno, buon Natale, buon Natale. Do you remember on November 12th, uh, when you looked at the newspapers, everybody was concerned because the floodwaters were flooding St. Mark's uh, Square in Venice? Well, what the Venetians were concerned about and what the scientists were concerned about was Palestrina, which is the Barrier Beach Island that protects uh, Venice. And for the first time in memory, you had seven foot waves that were breaking through the island and then backing up water into Venice. Um, and of course, we have our own Barrier Beach Island, about exactly the same, you know, eight miles long, the same as Palestrina. And um, we, here. Uh, and of course, we're all familiar with it. This is a sand that's going through the jetties. It's not building as much and as fast as we would like it to be, and it's not building where we would like it. Um, so, but if you did take the sand from that area where you have the, the free sand, if you will, simply put it on a truck and run it down the 69th Street uh, path and then put it directly on the, on the berm, it would be very cheap because you wouldn't be, it would be free sand as it were. Uh, so uh, uh, Chris is going to tell you a lot more about that. Um, he's a scientist uh, with the Virginia Institute of Marine uh, Sciences. Um, and he has a National Science Foundation grant to study to sort of to use Plum Island as a, as a case study uh, for the the intervention for of humans uh, on a barrier beach. So, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> we go. Is this on? Thank you, Bill, and thank you all very much for coming. I know it's a, it's a holiday weekend, obviously, and I appreciate you all taking the time out of your celebrations to hear about, well, summertime beach erosion. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, take a, I'm gonna start out with a bit of a longer view here when we think about this. As, as mentioned, I'm a geologist, and now I'm at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. The longer view is not this, but I'll start there anyway. The longer view is that I've been working here since 2005, 2000 and six when I was at Boston University. So my time working on Plum Island is not, is not new and it's not a Virginian showing up. It's worse, it's a New Yorker showing up <laughs> to study uh, Plum Island. Um, all right, so that's gonna kind of introduce Arias, get me into this. And the, the, the talk is, yep, I'm gonna move this. Another way of looking at this talk is we could ask a simple question. The, the beach is eroding, Palm Island is eroding, but is it that jetty? Well, maybe, and, and we'll get back there. We're gonna come back there. But I look at it as broader, the river, the sea, and the jetty. It's, uh, it's a very dynamic, complex system. So let's start. Uh, with a bit of thanks, first of all. So just to recognize, I am up here representing not just myself and my own science, but uh, scientists from across, I think across the east and Gulf Coast. Uh, so uh, a geochemist at BIMS, University of New Orleans, my former advisor, some of you may have seen some of his talks up here, Duncan Fitzgerald, uh, Peter Rosen, who I know some of you might know from Northeastern, economists from University of New Hampshire, and, and policy analysts from Woods Hole Oceanographic, UMass Lowell, a slew of students who have worked with me on this project throughout the years. And of course, I'd be remiss not to mention Storm Surge, and in particular, Mike Morris, who I know many of you will know from his time up here, who is a collaborator and a co-author on some of the work that we've published here. Uh, so a lot of partners on this, and we were funded. The work I'm presenting today, this is not entirely 
entirely common in science. Everything you're about to hear today is what we call open access. That means it's free to you. You don't need to be a university scientist with access to a library to get it, which is where so much of science is done. This is all open. And I'm going to show you the actual papers that this comes from at the end. And you can email me for links, or they're available online. And that is thanks to the National Science Foundation. All right, so Plum Island erosion starts in Virginia. <laughs> Why in Virginia? Because of the first point I want to make. Plum Island, yes, it's eroding, or at least it goes through cycles where it erodes and then it builds back up. And I spent my first you know, eight years as a coastal geologist working on Plum Island. I spent it on these beaches, mostly working on the southern end and the refuge itself rather than on the northern end. And, and you know, I'd, I'd hear about the erosion and be studying the dunes and, and how Plum Island formed. I thought, wow, this is what barrier islands are. And then I moved to Virginia, and I realized that that's also what barrier islands are, what you see there in Cobb Island, which is just about three feet of sand sitting on top of marsh that's constantly rolling over itself. We look at other locations. So this is the, the Virginia coast, the Delmarva Peninsula. Basically goes from Assateague Island down to the mouth of the Chesapeake. And this is very dynamic and very diverse set of barrier islands. And these barrier islands down there do something that Plum Island doesn't. They move. And they move. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm going to move, get my own computer. Media unstable. QuickTime not available. That's going to be disappointing if we don't have QuickTime on this computer. Well, here's what you'd see if the, if the video is working. <laughs> Apologies, not my computer. Is that that island would be moving. You'd actually watch it go from where it is here over a 30 year period to about there. The whole island moves. It stays about the same width, and the whole thing steps back with time. And that is just one of this set of islands that they all move. So here you have a map of Virginia's eastern shore. And you have numbers underneath the names of the islands. There's a number in parentheses and a second number in brackets. And all but one of them are positive numbers. And those numbers are in meters per year. So if you like thinking in feet, multiply it by three. So let's take, for example, uh, Cedar Island, which is <laughs> there, Cedar Island. Right? That five, what does that mean? It means it moves five meters per year. All right, so, so let's think about that. I'm here, I'm going to go to the beach. Year one, 4th of July, go to the beach, set down my towel, hanging out at the beach. I go back one year later. One year. And it has moved to here. And then it does it again the year after that. And again the year after that. Every single year. Those numbers are for the last 150 years it's been doing that. Now, anybody who spent any time on Plum Island knows it doesn't work that way. That it's not every year. Some years it grows. And then you'll get the big storm. By us, it was Irene, or it was Isabel, or Sandy, where the whole thing moves 10 years worth in one motion. Just for reference, the number in brackets is just the last 30 years. So these have sped up substantially. Now we're talking 30 feet per year, not 15 for that one island. And every one of them is doing it. All right. And this is what happens when you build on one of these islands. This is Hog Island. In yellow, you see the shoreline of Hog Island in uh, 1895. In purple, there's 1967. And it's overlain on imagery from 2016. In red, highlights the town of Broadwater on Hog Island, the lighthouse that sat out there. That lighthouse, picture taken in 1944. That thing is long gone. It's, it's half a mile out to sea, that location. Just to give you a sense of what barrier islands do, 
That is, over time, they keep their heads above water by storms wiping out the beach, wiping out the dune, and pushing that sand back towards the land so that over time they can keep up as sea level rises. They just march their way closer to land. The land gets flooded, the barrier island moves. And that, as we think as a geologist, thinks about barrier islands over periods of hundreds, two thousands of years, or in Virginia you could see it in decades. That's what happens. So that brings us here to Plum Island, right? which doesn't move at all. Plum Island has not small dunes that can be wiped out by a single storm. The beach doesn't get carved up by one storm and moved. The whole island doesn't move underneath the houses that are there. Yes, it erodes. But the whole island doesn't move. And more than that, it hasn't moved in 4,000 years. It's not, we're not talking about 15 feet a year. We're talking it hasn't moved in 4,000 years. Right? And the reason is this. The reason is that unlike Virginia, unlike barrier islands throughout much of the world, Plum Island has the Merrimack River, which drains most of New Hampshire, northern Massachusetts, areas that have a lot of sand in them. And it delivers that sand to the beach. And it's been doing that for thousands of years. So our reconstruction, some of our earlier work, like big scale of Plum Island, we're able to picture Plum Island as it was maybe about 3,000 years ago. No marsh behind it. The Great Marsh didn't exist. There were multiple tidal inlets through the island. The island was lower. There weren't large rolling dunes through it. It was narrower. And it was multiple islands broken up. Right? And we know this through, as shown on the right there, it's my graduate student and I. Perhaps you saw us back out here in 2013, 14, 15, collecting cores out in the marshes and on the island and in <clears throat> some people's backyards with permission. And <laughs> we, we were able to reconstruct how the island has changed through time from 3,000 years ago to what we see today, <laughs> filled in. And why? Because this, this river has been pumping out sand out through the mouth of the Merrimack River along the island and up into the back barrier through the southern inlet or direct from across Joppa Flats and down the south side across where the park, the, the, uh, the turnpike is now. So it's changed quite a bit, but it hasn't moved, unlike islands throughout the world. This is one, an example of one that is entirely stable. So I want, that's, that's one of the take homes here. Plum Island, it erodes, it actually doesn't move. It's, it's an incredibly stable barrier island. That's not to say nothing changes, right? It's not to say nothing changes. We'll get there. And the reason for this is, as I mentioned, sand. Sand coming out of the river and along the beach. And how do we know this? How do we know that this happens? All right, so quick pause here. I'm going to be showing you all some data tonight. Right? I'm not just, it's not just pictures. I'm going to bring you through our science as well and show you some of our raw data that we've worked up and show you the results, not just tell you what we know, because I, I want you to, to believe yourselves, not me. I'm going to show you what we know. So this next graph, there's a lot going on, and you're going to get it. It's no problem. Okay? <laughs> I promise. There's a lot going on. All right. All right. First of all, Forget about everything to the left, all right? So just don't even, we're, we're going to get there later. Just forget about that. Let's just look at this side of it. What this graph shows is the, along the x-axis, along the bottom, is the distance from the Merrimack River Inlet. So from the south jetty. And that's shown in that, that vertical dashed line there, the south jetty line there, right? So this is going to the south from the jetty along the beach all the way down to Wingersheet Beach. And we've gone, by we, I mean one of my undergraduate students, went and walked the whole beach, it was terrible, and collected samples along the way. Samples from the beach, sample from the dune, sample from the low tide line. And we just ran something as simple as grain size. Grain size. How big is the sand? Oh, it's, it's, seems about the same all the way down. But what you realize 
when you analyze it, that it actually does change. That is, it gets finer. Sand, so on this graph, this is all grain size, shown in different ways. We could use this one on this side. This is millimeters. And this is the average, roughly median grain size in millimeters. Coarser is to the bottom, finer is to the top. So what that means is that going from eh, just south of the jetty all the way down across Castle Neck, at least, sand gets finer and finer. And in geologists speak, we call that more mature. That is, the sand that comes out of the river is very coarse. It's got a lot of rocks in it. It's still being broken up. And it gets smacked time and again by wave after wave after wave after wave. And as that happens, it gets ground down finer and finer and finer and finer. This is how we could tell which way sand moves. The finer it is, you see a trend like that, that tells you that sand moves from the mouth of the Merrimack, or just south of the jetty, to the south, as it gets finer as you go. Make sense? That's, that's it. It doesn't matter. All it says is it doesn't matter if you're in the dune, you're in the mid-beach, or you're at the low tide line, it gets finer. All three of those lines, fine the same exact way. So this is good evidence for us. And why is that? Here it's nor'easters, of course, the big northeast storms that drive, well, you know, they've called northeast storms, of course, they move things from the northeast to the south. And here those waves come in at that angle and drive sand gradually to the south along most of the island, most of it. We'll come back to what's going on on the other side in a little bit. And that sand over the millennia has kept this river, this, this barrier island stable, has helped it grow, has helped those dunes get as large as they are, close those inlets, form the big sandbars that are navigational hazards. Been there, right? They are, it is that sand that is responsible for the stability of Plum Island. You can thank the river. And you can thank the river that once looked like this. The river that had, uh, you know, drains the mountains of New Hampshire, the White Mountains. You know, this large forested lowland area across all of Massachusetts and southern New Hampshire. Thick soils. You had abundant forests sand all through that river. And this river would deliver some mud, a lot of sand out to the, well, yeah, this is an idealized, this is one of my students drew this, but this is an idealized graph of some island system. Call this, you could call that Salisbury and call that Plum Island if you want. But, you know, delivered out to the beach and along the beach. And that's what Europeans found when they got here. This island that hadn't moved in thousands of years with the Merrimack River feeding it with sand. Okay? This is where the story starts to change. And we go from that, this river beach system, stable for thousands of years, to that. Something that where to walk you through some of uh, key ones, upstream dams. I'm sure you know the big dams of Lowell, right? for example, that, that trap all on the main stem. But there's also literally hundreds of small run of the river dams on the tributaries of the Merrimack. And each of those traps water, but also traps sand behind them. Some of them are, in fact, full. There's also deforestation. Well, what that does is allows for erosion to remove some of the sand and mud, remove the soils, and deliver them to the river. So some gets trapped behind dams, but you also have more because of deforestation and agriculture. Um, you have sand mining along parts of the river. You have constrictions and flow and, and taming of the river, holding it in place, holding it narrow, okay? building walls along the sides of the river. And then, of course, we do the same thing, um, as anybody around here knows, to the mouth of the river and to the island itself, where you build things like jetties. You build uh, houses along the beaches, and you try to tame the beach as well. That's where the story really changes for Plum Island. I'm going to walk you through some of that history. This is an abbreviated history of the Merrimack River and Plum Island. It is not the complete history. Um, 
some of this we elongate on, you know, we, we discuss more in the papers. Um, on the top here, let's see, a lot going on here as well, but I'm gonna walk you through this one. So here you have age, going back to 2400, so about well, 4,500 years ago, Plum Island is there, but just forming. Right? Uh, so 2400 BC to today. On this graph, I'm going to be showing on the y-axis the sedimentation rate. This is from a bunch of cores we took across Joppa Flats, the mouth of the river. And this is how much sand is being delivered and deposited there with time. So higher up means more sand is being deposited, lower means less. Very, very slow rate to deposition. On this, this is just a time scale. I'm going to show some key events through time. So the earliest documentation of Plum Island is Captain John Smith, 1614. This John Smith and his crew find the Plum Island that I just showed, this forested river system, this stable but dynamic barrier island. And very, very low sedimentation rates. The numbers, you know, it's 0 0.05 grams per square centimeter per year. I mean, all right. In other words, it's relatively low. You're going to see we're going we're gonna to quadruple that very soon. Europeans, we start colonization, and there's a rapid deforestation, especially starting in the lower Merrimack Valley, as well as the rest of coastal New England. We're not talking about the White Mountains here, the main source of sand. We're looking only at coastal New England. So for this period of time, we're still in that you know, very low rate, but we start to deforest, start to expose the landscape to rainfall, to start to wash some of that soil. And during this period of settlement and agriculture, we, start, we see a period going from about 1600 AD, or CE as we call it, to you know, about 1850 of intense settlement, intense agriculture, and higher rates of sediment. So that deforestation delivers more and more sand and mud into Joppa Flats and, of course, along Plum Island as well. Then we start the period where we go to, you know, taming the river, trying to control the river. So canals are the first. Later come the dams. Stone embankments. <coughs> dredging of the inlet. Now we have a navigational hazard because you know there's industry growing along the Merrimack River Valley and you need to have shipping, you know, vessels being able to transit from the coastal Atlantic up the Merrimack River. So we start to see that as well. So now we're changing the river mouth. We finally hit peak logging by about the late 1800s which corresponds with a very high rate of sedimentation. So now we have a lot more sand and mud making it to the mouth of the river during this time. As we start to deforest large parts of the Merrimack River Valley, now we're up in New Hampshire logging the, the drainage basin of the Merrimack, <coughs> allowing all that soil and the sands, everything that was holding it together, that vegetation holding it together is gone, and now it's just flowing into the river. And we see that down here, right in Joppa Flats. You can see the imprint of it. Eventually, though, 1936, there was the U.S. Flood Control Act, followed by a series of Army Corps river control projects, more dams. Right, we're, we're in the in the depression era of large projects, large-scale river taming projects, dams, reservoirs, all throughout the river. As well as, of course, we know changes to Lower Plum Island. We'll be getting to that as well. And that corresponds with that first drop. All of a sudden, now we have less sand and mud. So you start with a system that is long-term stable, receiving all of the sand, but still fairly low rates. It goes up, it hit a, hits a peak, that peak corresponds with the time when Plum Island becomes developed with people. Seems like there's a lot of sand, and then it starts to drop. It's perhaps a correlation there. The other thing that happened that allowed Plum Island to become stable was the Merrimack River mouth. The Army Corps builds up those, those jetties. Those jetties. Why? 
Why? Why do that? Well, let's look at the history there now. I'm going to be going through a set of slides here. On the top left, you're going to see an old map. This would be Plum Island in Salisbury. The date of that map is there. And then I've simplified it below it. So all land, the barrier islands, are in brown. And then in yellow are big sandbars. Those original sandbars are labeled on there. I've, tip, I've tried to label what they're called there. Those are called the breakers, north and south breaker, as they were called, because waves broke there. And obviously a navigational hazard. On the right, I have um, what, the ma what the river was doing. And what you're going to see here is the river doing what rivers do, what inlets do. That is, they move. They wag. Think of it as a wagging, wagging tail of a dog, where you've got that river coming out. It's not just going to go straight out and send sediment. It's going to, you got those waves moving things around, and the, it, it migrates like this. And watch what that does to Plum Island through time, before those jetties were installed. 1809, 1826, you'll notice that the Inlet has started to migrate to the south. Now, instead of being straight out, it shoots to the south. And you're carving into what is now what I call the, the east <coughs> fork of Plum Island, the northern part of Plum Island. It's gone. That no, It used to exist, and it's gone by 1826 as the river migrates to the south. Right? 1830. It's gotten even worse. Right? Now you're really carving in right down through what would later become the basin. That's the river running right through there. Right? Really moving in, eroding now the west side, the western side of Plum Island, the west, what's the west shoreline of the basin. Right? That was formed and eroded in 1830. However, this is not stable. The river is just going, if you look at that, look at how far the river's got, water's got to travel, right? It's got to go, it's not just going straight out. Water wants to get, all it knows is gravity. Water wants to get to the ocean as quickly as possible. Well, that's an awfully long way to travel. So what does it do? It breaches. It breaches that inlet. It breaches. That large was called an ebb tidal delta formed by the ebb or falling tides, and it goes straight out. And the, that large bar of sand that had been built up, this bar of sand there, migrates on shore, welds to Plum Island, and what does it become? The point, as they call it then. Eastern, the northeastern, the eastern fork of Plum Island becomes, is from that bar, formed in one event. You know, thing breaches, this bar migrates on shore and welds. And we call it the collapse of the ETD, ebb tidal delta. Right? It migrates on shore and welds. And eventually, by 1883, it becomes, it grows and becomes the East Fork of Plum Island that we know today, more or less. And that's when folks back then said, whoa, we can't have this happening. We need, we need known navigation. We need a deep channel that we can get these vessels up the Merrimack River right, to the mills along the Merrimack Valley. And so they planned. They had not been built yet. They planned the jetties at that point. That's what's shown in the 1883 map as pulling off. And you know what? This didn't just happen once. The jetties did, but everything before that, it was a cycle. The inlet would migrate, 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 breach. Migrate, 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 breach. Wagging of that river mouth through time would erode Plum Island, wipe out that part of it, and then let it regrow over and over again through time, through history, until those jetties went in. So. One of the questions is always, well, you know, the jetties, are they causing the erosion? Well, maybe, but without them, there is no northeast fork of Plum Island. It would not exist. Right? And history could tell us that. Right? And it's only the stabilization of Plum Island thanks to those jetties 
that allowed, this is from one of my graduate students, Andy Fallon, this number of houses on the y-axis in time from 1850 to today. Right? You can see the growth of Plum Island. And note when that starts. Right? It's not a coincidence there that that starts around the time that the jetties are complete. All of a sudden, the island is stable. It's not being wiped out by the river every two dozen years. It can't move anymore. So it's more or less stable. <coughs> and we'll see through time that there are other ma you know, major river mouth dredging and then the groins built along the beach. And we'll come back to those in just a minute. Right? Make some sense? That's kind of the big scale. I think about Plum Island. That's what I think we need to keep in mind in these discussions, is that it's not just the, the jetties and the reservation terrace eroding. You take those out, and Plum Island goes back to, remember the basin, that, what you're looking at there, it has that shape because it is the old river. That is the Merrimack River, blew right through there, okay? not that long ago. Yeah. Sorry, you can't see that. <laughs> quick time doesn't work. It's always quick time. Um, what that shows, though, is that these, these inlets are supposed to be dynamic. They are supposed to move. And it, you just could, because you stabilize those jetties, stabilize that inlet mouth with those jetties, does not mean that the whole inlet stops you know, its dynamism. It doesn't just, no, that's it, I'm done. I'm just going to sit here. It doesn't. There's still going to be dynamics in the system. There's still going to be cycles, and that's what we witness now. So here is a part of Plum Island. You might recognize the Center Island area. This is from, I believe, 2013, I think, this picture. Maybe 2005, it doesn't really matter for this. But this, you know, you know Center Island, Annapolis, Fordham Ways, OK? Um, I'm going to show you some erosion. Right? I think. Many of you, anybody who's here might remember this from 2008. That's the shoreline in 2008 in yellow. And you'll remember, I remember, my, some of my first trips up here were some of these houses that went in or were undermined and taken out. But what you'll notice here, if you look at this, there's the shoreline. That's the, the mid-tide line. If you ever go out and see the rack on the beach, that's what we're mapping there. That's your rack line on the beach right, through time. And you'll notice that it's kind of, there's this notch. We call the hot spot of erosion, right? the area where the ro erosion is really quite intense. And if you've been here, you've witnessed what I'm about to show you. It started to heal. By 2010, it had bumped back out. But by 2013, Center Island had healed, and that hot spot had migrated to the south. <coughs> and by 2018, it had gone even further south. So this healed, and that bumped out. So the same area that was a hot spot here is now a very wide beach. This area in 2013, nice and narrow, much wider. And now the erosion is down here. So what we see is we don't see the river mouth migrating and eroding the entire northeast fork of Plum Island and then coming back. But what we see is this much smaller scale hot spot erosion that we all witness out there. And this isn't just like the river mouth migrating. That wasn't the first time. Guess what? This wasn't the first time. Anybody with, with some history on the island knows that this has happened before. Nineteen seventy four, seventy six, seventy eight. You know what happened in the fifties too? It happened in the twenties as well. It's a cycle, twenty five, forty years. This hot spot shows up, it starts in the north, it migrates south, and then it poof disappears. And everything heals, and we think this is great. Let's build, let's build bigger, let's build, let's build. Let's move closer, right? I mean, it makes sense. It's over because we're humans and our institutional memory is only so long, right? 
Right? This is normal. There's no, nothing wrong with that. Except by looking back at the history, yeah, we, we, or forgetting to look at the history, we're of course doomed to repeat it. And it will, it has happened before and it will happen again. Why? That's the question, right? I'm the scientist, right? So like, all right, Chris, that's great. Nice history. Good job. Why? <laughs> ah, yes. Sorry. Before I get to why, you know, of course, our most recent response. But you'll know that this response has changed. And in fact, this is, I love this because, you know, that was obviously the construction of the seawall it's gone in. Right? And, uh, and then in December 13, there's yeah, it complete, but I want to point out something else in that right-hand photo. As a reminder of, rep of us repeating history, why do you think those groins went in? I said that erosion happened in, in the 50s. Hmm. So groin that went in just north of this area, right just south of, of the parking area at Center Island there. Hmm. Because this has happened before, and our response is the same, rocks. <laughs> Big rocks, right? And it will continue to be so. Now, let's get to that why. All right, here's what we did. Give you a quick summary of some of the things you did. On the far left, that is, you know, I'm recognizing it really quickly, Palm Island, there's the river mouth, there's the jetty, jetty, there's the northeast fork, there's northwest fork, right? And then this basically ends just a bit south of the entrance to the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. And this is the hot spot as it was. And what you're looking at here is big feature. This is a bathymetric map. So you're looking at the depth of water there. So the lighter things here, it's shaded, but this lighter area looks in three dimensions like it's shallower. It is. That is what's called the ebb tidal delta. It's a delta like the Mississippi, except much smaller. And it's an ebb tidal delta. It's formed by the ebb or dropping tides. And that ebb tidal delta is responsible for everything that we're seeing with the erosion hotspot, right? which is in down, down in this area. And there's different names here. Call this the terminal lobe. That means the, you know, the terminus, the end of the ebb delta lobe. Uh, you know, it's, that's where the thing drops off. You'll know if you've ever been out through there where the deep water really starts. It's, you know, it's deep in the channel, shallows up, and then it drops off. That's that. There's your jetty. And you have these bars and other weird features in there. I'm going to talk about these more as we go. What I show here on the right are just two snapshots of some modeling we've done. Now, you've heard the Army Corps has done some modeling. I'll return to some of the Army Corps stuff later. Uh, we didn't do anything quite like the Army Corps. They took different jetty configurations and modeled those. What we did is we said, let's hit it with different storms. Let's take the modern configuration and hit it with different. Let's let the hot spot move and see why through time. So we're asking a question rather than testing an engineering solution. It's a scientific rather than engineering approach. And those are some of our results. And if we look at what we've learned from this modeling, right? oh, by the way, so, and if you're curious here, this is wave height shown here. So yellow is higher wave height. And what you'll notice is around the ebb delta, there it's quite high. And then it drops off very quickly as you get onto that delta. Anybody who's been out there would know this. Right, that the delta is actually pretty low wave energy. It's a lot lower inside the inlet. But much higher wave energy down here, right near the hot spot of erosion. And over here, this is um, you know, arrows. So this is depth, but also arrows showing which way the waves are moving, which way the energy is moving. And what we've learned from this, I'm going to simplify it a little bit by just zooming into that area. So again, here's our map. I'm going to show here different periods from 2005 till nearly present of that center island area. And I'm going to point out some features. Like, for example, there's part of that. You can see it. You see the sand there under the water, right? You can see this is just Google Earth. Anybody could do this. Right? Um, there's that sand. That's part of that terminal lobe right there. Right? And then you'll notice there's another bar out there as a whole. There's this bar that runs all along the island. We call it the Longshore Bar. It ends. And the terminal lobe ends, and there's a hole. And what we see is, through our modeling efforts, that waves coming in, we ran it with northeast waves, the big storms, that those waves come in, they enter that gap, and they, they disperse. They go in all directions. So they go through a narrow opening, and then come out the other side 
and move in all directions away from it on the other side. So that single wave comes through, and you'll have that wave move to the north, north of that area, move to the south, south of that area. And that is why anybody who spends time in this area recognizes, if you've ever been out in the near shore swimming on the beach, if you're north is, generally on most days, either it's quiet water day and our winds and waves tend to come out of the south, or it's a storm, and if you're in the northern part of the island, they're also coming out of the south, even though your waves might be coming out of the north that day during a nor'easter. That is because those waves come through and diverge, head to the south, continue to feed the refuge, continue to feed, move sand to the south, continue to feed things to the south, and move to the north. Right? And then there's also some diffraction or fraction along Reservation Terrace, which I'll get to in just a minute. Don't worry, I'm not leaving out Reservation Terrace. Right? All right, let's walk through time again. So here we are in 2009. Now that gap has moved further south, right offshore of it is this, or right onshore is the hot spot. What has happened here? So the gap moves a little bit to the south, and what that does is, remember at that point, waves coming in are moving to the north and to the south. So they're moving sand to the north, and they're moving sand to the south. What does that mean for that area right there? Yeah, no sand. Yeah, everything's moving away from it. So what do you get? Erosion. Mm -hmm. right? You get a hot spot of erosion, as we call it. And that's exactly what happens. So 2009, that hot spot's there. It gets stuck. It gets pinned on that groin along Center Island. And if you watch here, if you watch what's going on with you, remember how that inlet before those jetties, it would migrate, it would come back, it would migrate. Guess what still happens? It migrates, but not as much, and it all happens offshore of the jetties. The river can't move inside the jetties, but out here, it can migrate to the south, and it still does the same thing. So watch the next set of slides and watch it happen. Inlet migrates to the south. That pushes this whole system, this whole ebb delta to the south. It moves the bar gap to the south, which moves the erosion hotspot to the south. Going to go back one. Okay? It's that gap. Now, sand moving in the north, sand moving in the south, and there's a hole in the middle. <coughs> Meanwhile, further north, hey, you got this big bar up here. You know, the sand coming out, going into the Ebb Delta. Some of that peels off as little sandbars migrate onshore and heal the beach. So that beach grows again. Center Island's growing. It's receiving sand peeling off of the Ebb Delta. It continues. Moves further to the south. Just like it were cutting into Plum Island, except now it's just in the Ebb Delta. The bar gap has moved further south. We're peeling sand off, really healing that northern part of the island. But now it's Fordham Way experiences the hot spot. Until eventually, just like in the past, this thing will breach through, head straight out through the inlet, and we return to where we started. The bar gap to the north. Any remnants of that area get healed with sand, and we start the process all over in another you know, period of maybe 20 years. This has taken about 10, maybe it's another 20, and we start this again. Now the channel has cut a new path and it's gonna start to migrate, shift this down, and the whole thing's gonna happen again. And again, and again. It's natural, well, it's sort of natural, right? There are these, there are these jetties that are built there, right? But what's natural is sand moves, rivers migrate, inlets migrate. They're gonna do it regardless of what we try to put there to stop them. Now they're just uh, quite a bit more subtle. Remember, before, this whole area got wiped out every time the inlet migrated. Now we get a hot spot moving along the beach. What's worse one time after the next? Does it get worse? Are the houses more in the infrastructure, the public and private infrastructure larger and more expensive? Do we get, get lulled into a sense of, of calm that, that this beach is now healthy? You know, this is, there's the human side and there's the natural side. 
This is the natural side. This is what's going on. This is what all the data are telling us are happening in this area. That you go through these cycles. Again, these, you know, a bunch of years here. I'll show you which ones, right? Of growth and, and you know, bounce back. The Plum Island grows and it erodes, and it grows and it erodes. That beach will do this over and over and over. Right? There's a big gap in this slide because then there's the interaction with what's happening inside the inlet. So this is where all the, all the, all the action is right now, right? The hot spot's largely healed, and where it was or would be is largely protected by seawall. And here, and again, just to orient everybody, the arrows, the red arrows point to the same house. If anybody owns that house, you're allowed to call out now and me, me, but. <laughs> right? So thank you for your, for your house. I appreciated it. I used it in my, in my uh, paper. Um, all right, those are the years there, right? So 1952 in yellow, 78. Oh, where is the shoreline? Oh, in orange, 94. Okay, on the same area. Oh, 2000, we're doing well. 2008, 2018. Oh, so the, tw the 2018 shoreline and the 1978 shoreline are the same place. Oh, it's like a cycle. <laughs> huh, right? Funny about that. All right, well, this one has a different cause. We're inside the inlet here. We're not looking at the ebb tidal depth. We're not looking at the river wobbling, right? Because it's stabilized. You have the jetties here. We're inside the jetties. So what is causing this? Well, check this out. Let's look at that 1952. Wide beach along Reservation Terrace. Fairly narrow beach along the front side. 2018, the opposite. Very, very cut back here. Look at how wide the beach is. Now, Bill alluded to this earlier. What's going on here? There's an interaction between the front side, the ocean side, and Reservation Terrace. And if we look back in time again, from 1950 to 2020 here, or almost to 2020, I'll add a dot next week, um, then <laughs> What we see is that there are periods where we don't have good data. There are some, you can look at Google Earth, there's nothing high resolution you can really see really well. So you have to kind of, well, we don't show it, right? We don't try to make up, we're not gonna make up data. We just don't show it as scientists. That's the way I handle that. Um, because we don't know. But you sure can imagine that Reservation Terrace in red, this is its area. This is the area of the beach through time. I, it's mean normalized. All that is is it goes from, you know, one is it's at its average. Any number above one means it's wider than its long-term average. Any number below one means it's smaller than its long-term average, that area of the beach. So we start out wider than its long-term average. Right? Both of them are. And then you'll notice that Reservation Terrace plummets in the 70s, 80 and then comes back up, much larger by 2010, and then back down. And what you'll notice on the oceanfront beach, which is what we measure, it's everything from the refuge line up to the jetty, right, north to the jetty, does just the opposite. So this is looking like it's probably a lot wider when Reservation Terrace is narrower, and then the other way around. It's a lot narrower when Reservation Terrace is wider. You'll notice the most recent switch that we're experiencing today. And why is that? <coughs> we're going to return to this graph. I know you all loved it. All right. <laughs> now, instead of looking at the right side, let's look at the left side. From about, I'm call about 500, this is in meters, again, multiply by, by three for feet, if you're more comfortable there. So 1,500 feet from, south of the jetty up to about a mile-ish, two miles from the, from the um, yeah, about a mile from the, uh, from the jetty itself, okay? Up, this is now up, going into the basin there, up along the, the uh, the Reservation Terrace Beach. So we went and did the same thing, different student actually, went and did the same thing and walked that part of the beach. She had a much, much shorter walk. Um, 
And you know, it's so it's a lot messier. But what you see is the same thing. The coarsest sands are just south of the jetty. Just south. And you can draw a line and it goes, at least for some of them, certainly for the beach itself goes up that direction. Certainly for the dune it goes up that direction. Gets a little bit funky once you get down into the inner tidal zone, but generally things fine. It gets finer, which again tells us that our transport is from the jetty in to the west along that beach. That's what we've learned. That's what the sedimentology tells us. Literally hundreds of samples and, and countless hours in the lab and says exactly what people have noticed. Sand moves from the jetty in to the west. Okay. And of course, right, this is this has already been mentioned, right? That that this was how it happened in 2012 before they repaired the jetty. This is largely how it happened. You had sand that moved along the beach, remember, to the north. You're north of the bar gap. You're north of that divergence point, the hot spot point. So sand moves to the north and, oh, nice hole, up and continues its path along. And what we're able to identify here is, this is from 2016 now, post repair of the jetty. You'll notice that that hole is gone, that we have this large bar of sand here. And erosion, the beginning of the very serious erosion along Reservation Terrace. And what we've been able to do with our model, combined with our sampling and, and statistical analyses, is come up with this map of movement. That is, you start with sand, actually really start with this sand up here. Coming down the river, you start in the White Mountains. Coming down the river, across Joppa Flood, down through the, the channel, out the mouth, around, over towards <coughs> via those bars migrating on shore from the ebb tidal delta, welding to the beach. South of a certain point, it heads south. Refuge folks say thanks. North of that point, it heads to the north. <coughs> and now gets trapped on the south side of the jetty. When that jetty is in a state of disrepair, or during very, very large storms that can send waves over that jetty, then sand will move up in this direction. <coughs> and along this beach, and you can see this little spit of sand that comes out here. Maybe you don't need to see it. Maybe you've hit it with your boat. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know anybody who's done that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we spent half a tidal cycle there once. Anyway, um, and th there it is. It's little, you can, you can almost see the swirls of sand coming off there. Not quite, that's not what they are, but that's what it looks like. You can picture it. And it's a big swirl, it's a big cycle going into here. So some of the sand gets swirled off, you know, a cream in a, in a, in a black coffee, right? Mm -hmm. Being swirled around. Some of it gets caught back up in this and back out and does it again. So there's probably grains that have gone through this several times. Grains of sand moving as a river, <laughs> flowing by waves, by water, right? moving around there. And if you shut that off, well, yes. Right? And that seems to be, that's what the historic and the sedimentologic data tell us, is a likely scenario for at least part of Reservation Terrace. I am not, I am not going to answer the question that we posed on the first slide here. Palm Island erosion, is it the jetty? I am not going to say yes. Because I think one of the things I've shown you here is that without the jetty, what would Palm Island look like? This would not exist. That would be the river right back there. That harbor would be a river. This would not exist. And of course it would, and then it would be eroded again, and then it would reform, and, then it, and so on and so forth. There's cycles. It's a beach. There's cycles. There's seasons. There's, there, you go back after a storm. It's eroded and flat. It builds back up in the summer. It gets whacked. This is the longer term cycle. It lasts dozens of years, and this cycle will occur over and over. That does not answer, and I know this, it does not answer the what should be done about it, but hopefully gives some insight into the science of what's causing it through time. So that's my take home. Oh yeah, that's the old shoreline. 
Just a reminder. So my take homes here. Pavon's eroding. You don't need me to tell you that. But only at its northern end. It, overall, Pavon is incredibly stable. In fact, I hold it up academically at conferences and say, I'm going to show you a stable island that doesn't move. You will go, what? <laughs> and not because it's been stabilized, as we've done in some of, many of ours along the coast, but because naturally it's stable. Thank you, Merrimack River. Any residents of New Hampshire, your sacrifice <laughs> is appreciated. Right? <laughs> so it's a very stable island. And but. But there are fingerprints of humans on it, right? starting really with colonization. That, that the Merrimack River can be found dating back to the arrival of Europeans that ended, really culminated in the stabilization of the mouth of the river, the stabilization of northern Plum Island, stopping the wagging of the tail. Um, making Northern Plum Island habitable, allowing for the development that we see there today, that started as cottages and has grown and grown and grown. That's the jetties. That's the stabilization of, of the northern part, the dynamic, the only dynamic part of a really stable island that doesn't move year to year. Very unlike Virginia. And then these same jetties, they set up this pattern of erosion and what we call accretion, a regrowth of the ocean front beach. Cycles every 25 to 40 years. The pattern hasn't changed, but the human impacts have. And we try to stabilize and harden, build bigger, build closer. And we try to live with it as best we can. And the same jetties also alter the movement of sand between the ocean front and reservation terrace. Likely, almost definitely exacerbating, but not necessarily fully causing the erosion inside the jetties. I don't know. This is a question that's on everybody's mind, and it should be. You're right to be asking this. I say this with the perspective of thousands of years, not myself, but <laughs> of what I study. Right? That the future of Plum Island and the island itself, it'll be fine. What's the worst that's going to happen? It's going to migrate landward. That's what islands do. I showed you that in Virginia. Right? The human habitation of the island, the future of people interacting with that island and how we use it, that is not a scientific question. It's an engineering question. And I think it's a societal question. And that's a question that I want to answer for you, but I think you need to answer for me and for each other. Right? That's a community question. And I hope that I know it's, it's, a, it's a challenging topic here. And I hope that, that you know, this provides some background, some of the scientific input, years of study that have gone into this that can help provide some of the foundational facts to debate around, not debate on, but debate around in deciding the societal question here, or the answer to the societal question. So with that, I'm going to put in a plug for the boss. So BIMS has uh, Virginia Student Marine Science. They have a monthly e newsletter. There's a lot of us there doing things outside of geology, as far as you know, I'm the only one working on Plum Island or this area. But uh, I hope to continue to do so. I will give you my contact information, email, uh, website, which has some key things. About, and my, if anybody, if any of you are on the, on the Twitter, um, I was very creative with my, with my name. And then below, I have, and this is a great one. I know this will be made uh, publicly available. You can also go to my website. It's very easy. Vims at edu slash coastal underscore geology will get you there. But I have links to those three things. Those are the front pages of papers that we've published. All, everything I presented tonight, plus more, is in those three papers there. Uh, the one on the left, 2019, I wrote that. A bunch of my students and colleagues, one of my students wrote the middle one. Another one is mine. These are looking at different time periods, different parts of this system. Everything I showed tonight is developed into those. This is all out there and publicly available. And you can't find it online, drop me a line. I'm happy to send you those for more information. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. And thank you very much. And I know 
we have microphones, right? There's microphones here uh, for people asking questions or project. I think the mics allow the questions to go into the recording system as well. We'll get to that mic. Hang on. Test, test. Nope. Coming. Test, test. Hey, I, uh, I live on uh, Reservation Terrace. And what you say, uh, is, I see happening. I mean, so I, I, do, I do confer with exactly what you're saying. Uh, 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 the the, uh, I'll repeat the too. beach in front of my house, which I live south of the jetty, south jetty, 500 feet maybe south of it, has grown. Uh, and the last few years, the storms, it's usually two or three storms a year, bring waves in between the jetties. And that's what's <coughs> taken out that sand in front of northern residents, mm -hmm. terrace, yep. in front of those houses. Um, so my question is, you're you seem to be, uh, you don't have a natural answer. It, this happened to coincide with the jetty repairs. Yeah. So I guess you're saying you're really not sure if it's a cause of the jet, jetty repairs or it's you were in that cycle. You seem to be tending more towards that cycle. So, I kind of yeah. agree with you. I kind yeah. of agree with you. But my question would be, do you have any idea where we are with that site, or in that site. Yeah. Because if it's going to be for another 20 years, the, you know, and it's going to keep going for a while, that, I tell you, two more storms, the Northern Reservation Terrace is going to be gone. Yeah. So I don't know if you, you I was careful here, right? So I didn't actually give, I gave this great explanation. I think it was great. I gave this explanation detailing why the hot spot erosion occurs and all the physical processes and what, I did not give an explanation as to why reservation terrace erodes and what causes that cycle. Because I don't think the two sequences of data are enough. We see it twice. This one absolutely corresponded with the jetty repair. The other one lagged. There was a lag in between them. However, as I think Bill showed earlier as well, you do see now, as the jetty's settled, as it is, you are able to see some sand move up and over. So while I- used to, used to be over. Yes. And now it's, it's, and it's again, able during the larger storm events, during the higher tides, some of it is able to get back over, but clearly not enough to resolve the problem. So no, that does not say, and we don't, I know, we don't have time to wait for the next cycle to go through before we could come up with the, which is what I would love to do as a scientist, wait for the next cycle. But we don't have time for that if you live there. Um, so I do think that considering that there is a causation, at least to some degree, exacerbation, maybe not sole causation, but a, a link, a very clear link between between the repair of the jetties that build that up. You can see the sand moving before. You cannot now. You see how it's built out. All of this is in front of our eyes. It doesn't take a geologist to see it. That tells us that there is a link there and that it might not be a purely natural cycle driving this, that this circular pattern of movement along reservation, because of the, the waves that come in through the jetties and move that sand to the west, as you observe, that is, is going to continue to happen. And could it be some, we looked into this, we tried to prove this, in fact, because you know what? Mike Morris, I'll give him a lot of credit, He's the one who convinced me. He's like, nah, I really think it's coming over. And Bill, hey, look at these, look at these great photos. I was like, oh, come on, the jetties. And I tried to prove him wrong. I tried, now it's probably the river migrating, meandering, something else going up. They were, at least for this last one, they're right. And at least that's what our data show, that that is absolutely right. And so I could not find another cyclical mechanism, something natural about what the river's doing or what's going on in there, some other dynamic that's driving that. And therefore, unfortunately, I apologize, 
but we don't have an answer to that question uh, outside of what's happening at the jetties, which I imagine is going to be your thought. Yeah, I, I was just going to mention, uh, do you remember what, what happened in, in uh, 1978? I don't know if you were up here. <sighs> we, we had a blizzard. <laughs> We, we had a blizzard, and it broke through the jetty. Mm -hmm. And and you had exactly the same cycle that we're seeing now. Yeah. The sand started going through. And actually, we're getting, uh, the Woods Hole study said that there's about 30,000 uh, 30, cubic yards of sand that's going from the center of the island north. Mm -hmm. And we're getting about 24,000. The last time I measured it, we were getting 24,000 uh, cubic yards going going through the jetty. Yeah. So we're basically, so, we're, it, it, we're getting that natural flow now back. And yet, is it still eroding? Oh, yeah. uh, well, that beach is both eroding and growing, and growing elsewhere at the, at the yeah. same time. Yep. And because the waves are diffracting, the sand is going to the side, so, yep. not to, it's, it's the same, the same gap. So you're pushing it to the west. Yep. You're not, you haven't filled the gap yet. You almost have to, yeah. 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 You need a, it's a, it's, and, and it's traffic. Course. It's traffic pattern. Where right now the traffic's moving. You need a, you need, you need an accident up front to slow the sand movement behind it and fill in the gap. Yeah. yeah. I, and I guess the question that we would all like to know is how long is that going to take before it, before it starts, I mean, we're seeing it growing. Yeah. Uh, it, it, we could do a problem. I'm not going to stand up here and try to do math on this. Um, but we could probably do a back of the envelope calculation, try to estimate that yeah. based on those, if we look at historic data and try to come up with that. So that would be a good follow on for us to you know, pull a mic and get together and play with some maps and numbers. Yeah. That would be a fun thing to do and to try to at least estimate it. But it, I would not, you're never going to hear me in a courtroom say that's when it's going to be, right? I mean, that's, it's an estimate. It will be that great scientific tradition and over the beer conversation. Absolutely. It's <laughs> the only way. Yeah. Thank you. Your, your, your photos showed the beachfront in 20 through 2018. All that changed between 2018 and 2019. Yeah. What also happened about a year ago, one to one and a half, a year to a year and a half ago, is that more stone was added to the beach. It was added between the groins that had been placed, like in the 60s, which were perpendicular to the shore, mm -hmm. and the, what you call the seawall, mm -hmm. which was armoring the dunes. Mm -hmm. Before that time, sand had migrated between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, backhoes were out there filling the gap, and the sand now to the south of the center groin has stayed there hmm. and filled in those beaches, and the erosion north of those groins uh, over the last year uh, it has been, has been ter terrific. I mean, hmm. incredible erosion over that past year. So my question to you is, uh, I would like you to say something about the effect of the groins on the movement of sand. We talked about jetties yep. and dunes, but how about the groins? Yeah, the way we thought about the groins, yeah, you're right, I didn't really mention them much. The way we think about the groins is they seem to be roadblocks for the hot spot. That it almost gets, the groin ends up hanging up the hot spot. Is it again? So there's probably grains that have gone through this several times. Grains of sand moving as a river, <laughs> flowing by waves, by water. Right? Moving around there. And if you shut that off, well, yes. Right? And that seems to be, that's what the historic and the sedimentologic data tell us, is a likely scenario for at least part of reservation territory. I am not, I am not going to answer the question that we posed on the first slide here. Palm Island erosion, is it the jetty? I am not going to say yes. Because I think one of the things I've shown you here is that without the jetty, what would Plum Island look like? This would not exist. That would be the river right back there. That harbor would be a river. This would not exist. And of course it would, and then it would be eroded again, and then it would reform, and, then it, and so on and so forth. There's cycles. It's a beach. There's cycles. There's seasons. There's, there, you go back after a storm. It's eroded and flat. It builds back up in the summer. It gets whacked. This is the longer term cycle. It lasts 
dozens of years, and this cycle will occur over and over. That does not answer, and I know this, it does not answer the what should be done about it, but hopefully gives some insight into the science of what's causing it through time. So that's my take home. Oh yeah, that's the old shoreline. Just a reminder. So my take homes here. Pomon's eroding. You don't need me to tell you that. But only at its northern end. It, overall, Pomon is incredibly stable. In fact, I hold it up academically at conferences and say, I'm going to show you a stable island that doesn't move. People go, what? <laughs> and not because it's been stabilized, as we've done in some of, many of ours along the coast, but because naturally it's stable. Thank you, Merrimack River. Any residents of New Hampshire, your sacrifice is <laughs> appreciated. Right? <laughs> so it's a very stable island. And, but, but there are fingerprints of humans on it, right? starting really with colonization. That, that the Merrimack River can be found dating back to the arrival of Europeans that ended, really culminated in the stabilization of the mouth of the river, the stabilization of northern Plum Island, stopping the wagging of the tail, um, making northern Plum Island habitable, allowing for the development that we see there today, that started as cottages and has grown and grown and grown. That's the jetties. That's the stabilization of, of the northern part, the dynamic, the only dynamic part of a really stable island that doesn't move year to year. Very unlike Virginia. And then these same jetties, they set up this pattern of erosion and what we call accretion, a regrowth of the ocean front beach. Cycles every 25 to 40 years. The pattern hasn't changed, but the human impacts have. And we try to stabilize and harden, build bigger, build closer. And we try to live with it as best we can. And the same jetties also alter the movement of sand between the ocean front and reservation terrace. Likely, almost definitely exacerbating, but not necessarily fully causing the erosion inside the jetties. I don't know. This is a question that's on everybody's mind, and it should be. You're right to be asking this. I say this with the perspective of thousands of years, not myself, but <laughs> of what I study. Right? That the future of Palm Island and the island itself, it'll be fine. What's the worst that's going to happen? It's going to migrate landward. That's what islands do. I showed you that in Virginia. Right? The human habitation of the island, the future of people interacting with that island and how we use it, that is not a scientific question. It's an engineering question. And I think it's a societal question. And that's a question that I won't out answer for you, but I think you need to answer for me and for each other. Right? That's a community question. And I hope that I know it's, it's, a, it's a challenging topic here. And I hope that, that you know, this provides some background, some of the scientific input, years of study that have gone into this that can help provide some of the foundational facts to debate around, not debate on, but debate around in deciding the societal question here, or the answer to the societal question. So with that, I'm going to put in a plug for the boss. So Bims has uh, Virginia Student Marine Science. They have a monthly e newsletter. There's a lot of us there doing things outside of geology. As far as I know, I'm the only one working on Plum Island or this area. But uh, I hope to continue to do so. I will give you my contact information, email, uh, website, which has some key things. About, and my, anybody, if any of you are on the, on the Twitter. Um, I was very creative with my, with my name. And then below, I have, and this is a great one. I know this will be made uh, publicly available. You can also go to my website. It's very easy. Vimsit.edu slash coastal underscore geology will get you there. But I have links to those three things. Those are the front pages of papers that we've published. All, everything I presented tonight, plus more, is in those three papers there. Uh, the one on the left, 2019, I wrote that. A bunch of my students and colleagues. One of my students wrote the middle one. 
Another one is mine. These are looking at different time periods, different parts of this system. Everything I showed tonight is developed into those. This is all out there and publicly available. And you can't find it online? Drop me a line. I'm happy to send you those for more information. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. And thank you very much. I know we have microphones, right? Microphones here uh, for people asking questions or project. I think the mics allow the questions to go into the recording system as well. We'll get to that mic, hang on. Test, test. Nope. Coming. Test, test. Hey, I, uh, I live on uh, reservation charters. And what you say, uh, did I see happening. I mean, so I, I, do, I do confer with exactly what you're saying. Uh, uh, the the, uh, I'll repeat the beach in front of my house, which I live south of the jetty, south jetty, 500 feet maybe south of it, has grown. Um, and the last few years, the storms, it's usually two or three storms a year, bring waves in between the jetties. And that's what's <coughs> taken out that sand in front of northern residents, mm -hmm. terrace, yep. in front of those houses. Um, so my question is, you're. You seem to be, uh, you don't have an actual answer. It, this happened to coincide with the jetty repairs. Yeah. So I guess you're saying you're really not sure if it's a cause of the jet, jetty repairs or it's that you were in that cycle. You seem to be tending more towards that cycle. And so, I kind of yeah. agree with you. I kind yeah. of agree with you. But my question would be do you have any idea? where we are with that site, or in that site. <laughs> yeah, because if it's going to be for another 20 years, the, you know, and it's going to keep going for a while, that, the, the, I tell you, two more storms, yeah. the Northern Reservation Terrace is going to be gone. Yeah. So I don't know if you, I was careful here, right? So I didn't actually give, I gave this great explanation, I think it was great, I gave this explanation detailing why the hot spot erosion occurs and all the physical processes and what, I did not give an explanation as to why reservation terrace erodes and what causes that cycle because I don't think the two sequences of data are enough. We see it twice. This one absolutely corresponded with the jetty repair. The other one lagged. There was a lag in between them. However, as I think Bill showed earlier as well, you do see now, as the jetty's settled, as it is, you are able to see some sand move up and over. So while I- It used to be over. Yes. And now it's, it's, and it's again, able during the larger storm events, during the higher tides, some of it is able to get back over, but clearly not enough to resolve the problem. So no, that does not say, and we don't, I know, we don't have time to wait for the next cycle to go through before we could come up with the which is what I would love to do as a scientist, wait for the next cycle. But we don't have time for that if you live there. Um, so I do think that considering that there is a causation, at least to some degree, exacerbation, maybe not sole causation, but a, a link, a very clear link between between the repair of the jetties that build that up. You can see the sand moving before. You cannot now. You see how it's built out. All of this is in front of our eyes. It doesn't take a geologist to see it. That tells us that there is a link there and that it might not be a purely natural cycle driving this, that this circular pattern of movement along reservation, because of the, the waves that come in through the jetties and move that sand to the west, as you observe, that is, is going to continue to happen. And could it be some, we looked into this, we tried to prove this, in fact, because you know what? Mike Morris, I'll give him a lot of credit, He's the one who convinced me. He's like, nah, I really think it's coming over. And Bill, hey, look, at these, look at these great photos. I was like, oh, come on, the jetties? 
And I tried to prove them wrong. I tried, now it's probably the river migrating, meandering, something else going on. They were, at least for this last one, they're right. And at least that's what our data show, that that is absolutely right. And so I could not find another cyclical mechanism, something natural about what the river's doing or what's going on in there, some other dynamic that's driving that. And therefore, unfortunately, and I apologize, but we don't have an answer to that question uh, outside of what's happening at the jetties, which I imagine is going to be your thought. Yeah, I, I was just going to mention, uh, do you remember what, what happened in, in uh, 1978? I don't know if you were up here. <sighs> <laughs> okay. we, we had a blizzard. <laughs> We, we had a blizzard, and it broke through the jetty. Mm -hmm. And and you had exactly the same cycle that we're seeing now. No. The sand started going through. And actually, we're getting, uh, the Woods Hole study said that there's about 30,000 uh, 30, cubic yards of sand that's going from the center of the island north. Mm -hmm. And we're getting about 24,000. The last time I measured it, we were getting 24,000 uh, cubic yards going going through the jetty. So we're basically, we're, it, it, we're getting that natural flow now back. And yet, is it still eroding? Oh, yeah. uh, well, that beach is both eroding and growing, and growing elsewhere. At, at the same yeah. time. Yeah. And because the waves are diffracting, the sand is going to the sides, so, yep. not to, it's, it's the same, the same. Gap. So you're pushing it to the west. Yep. You're not, you haven't filled the gap yet. You almost have to, yeah. 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 You need a, it's a, it's, and, and it's traffic. Course. It's traffic pattern. Where right now the traffic's moving. You need a, you need, you need an accident up front to slow the sand movement behind it and fill in the gap. Yeah. yeah. I, and I guess the question that we would all like to know is how long is that going to take before it, before it starts, I mean, we're seeing it growing. Yeah. Uh, it, it, we could do a problem, I'm not gonna stand up here and try to do math on this, um, but we could probably do a back of the envelope calculation, try to estimate that yeah. based on those, if we look at historic data and try to come up with that. So that would be a good follow on for us to, you know, pull a mic and get together and play with some maps and numbers. Yeah. That would be a fun thing to do and to try to at least estimate it, but it, I would not, you're never gonna hear me in a courtroom say that's when it's gonna be, right? I mean, that's, it's an estimate. There will be that great scientific tradition and over the beer conversation. Absolutely. <laughs> it's the only way. Yeah. Thank you. Your, your, your photos showed the beachfront in 20 through 2018. All that changed between 2018 and 2019. Yeah. What also happened about a year ago, one, did one and a half, a year, a year and a half ago, is that more stone was added to the beach. It was added between the groins that had been placed, like in the 60s, which were perpendicular to the shore, mm -hmm. and the, what you call the seawall, mm -hmm. which was armoring the dunes. Mm -hmm. Before that time, sand had migrated between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, backhoes were out there filling the gap, and the sand now to the south of the center groin has stayed there hmm. and filled in those beaches, and the erosion north of those groins uh, over the last year uh, it has been, has been ter terrific. I mean, hmm. incredible erosion over that past year. So my question to you is, uh, I would like you to say something about the effect of the groins on the movement of sand. We talked about jetties yep. and dunes, but how about the groins? Yeah, the way we thought about the groins, yeah, you're right, I didn't really mention them much. The way we think about the groins is they seem to be roadblocks for the hot spot. That it almost gets, the groin ends up hanging up the hot spot such that you get this very bad erosion, because it's, when you've got the bar gap offshore, and the sand and, and the waves coming in, you always will get the development, the sand being piled up on one side and the deeper erosion on the north side. Because as sand moves from south to north along that part of the beach, it gets trapped behind those groins. So it almost, it seems like it gets, we call it hung up. It's, it looks like as it's migrating south, it gets stuck until it could jump to the next one uh, during the southerly migration period of it. And that's probably the way that it's, it's acting, is that as, even as that, that hotspot would naturally migrate to the south, 
the way that the sand's working, it's still able to pile sand up there on the south side of those and continue to pull sand away from the north side. Is it legal to do that? The groins? I don't know. <laughs> That's, I mean, yeah, don't know. I, I, I stopped following Massachusetts case law a long time ago. Uh, um, yep. So, yeah. And get that. I just have a comment for you. Um, about a year ago, the Army Corps of Engineers um, asked the research center, which I believe was in Mississippi, mm -hmm. to investigate Eric, yeah. whether uh, the coastal, whether the erosion reservation terrace was caused by the repair of the South Jetty. And about six months later, the answer came back that it did not cause it. Again, they used the word cause, not exacerbate, which was interesting. Yeah, so I've seen, yes, the uh, Army Corps Erdic, as they call it, the, the Engineering Research Development Center, did this study where they did, a, you know, I mentioned our modeling and their modeling, and they had done this period of study where what they did was they, 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 they did the same sort of hydrodynamic modeling using the Army Corps version of that. They elongated the jetties in this model, they shortened them, they took one out, and tried to see what's the relative movement of sand throughout the system with that. And, you know, in an exploratory way to try to better understand what's the best approach to the long-term management of these jetties. And they, like us, could not come up with a solution that said, the jetties are the absolute cause of this, of this erosion along Reservation Terrace. Uh, I think our data show, here's what they demonstrate to me, and what the models demonstrate to me. Uh, one, that the sand moves from east to west along that beach, which means that any sand that would move along that beach has to come from either outside the inlet or up and over the jetty. There's no other, or get caught in that circular pattern up there. Um, that is the, I'd say, the predominant thing we saw. We also very clearly see the correlation, if not causation, clear causing, a very clear correlation between what's happening on the oceanfront beach, especially the northern end, by the jetty, and what's happening along Reservation Terrace, and that switch seems to occur an association with changes to the jetty. That doesn't, again, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's a tricky place to be because I love to be able to say something definitive. Believe me, I'm more than, I've been doing this, this is my job, is to study this stuff. I would love to be able to say something definitive for you. I would have loved to have come here. I would have loved that paper to have said that one way or the other so that we could derive something. And, and I will not, I'm not working with, partnering with the Army Corps. We're entirely separate. They're not, uh, they were not on that front slide, so I'm not doing this to defend the Army Corps or anything else. It's just that we came to, par we did a parallel study using a lot of field data rather than just modeling and came up basically to the same place, which is I can't say it causes it. I don't know what their exact wording is what, you know, about exacerbation or anything else, whether, but I cannot definitively say it's the answer. That doesn't mean that that you shouldn't be considering the jetties and a reworking of how those operate lower, maybe different or into different porosity to allow some sand, as Bill showed in that video earlier, to move through the gaps there, some of it to move through a little bit easier. There are things to consider that could allow those jetties to better transfer sand and maybe help mitigate that problem. So, yeah. I know it's, it's not a conclusive answer, and I apologize, but that's where their science is right now. I had a question. Did you look at the correlation between previous repairs to the jetty and erosion along that same point? Um, some of us are under the impression, well, rightly or wrongly, that the previous repair of the jetty in the 70s led to very similar erosion along there, which led to the removal of the, of the um, Coast Guard mm -hmm. station, yep. and uh, also led to a very similar camp there, just north of the jetty. 
Yeah, yeah, we did. So that was that one graph I showed with that, um, yeah, that kind of the, the patterns down. If you look at that last one where the front beach and the, the island, they intersect, you know, and the reservation terrace, they intersect in their size and one the reservation terrace is shrinking. The, yes, the, and it is, once again, coincident with that. Um, not as coincident that time. There was a lag there. I actually believe that the, uh, the switch occurred prior to the jetty repair, but it was accelerated absolutely once that, once that jetty repair occurred. So the answer is we looked at it. There is definitely, once again, a correlation. I'd say it's a less clear correlation than what we see in the recent. This is like almost the same day you see the switch. Um, Although, I'll go to that quickly, because I want to point this out. I think it's worth... What year, what year were the jetties repaired? In the 1970, and then broke through in 78. And, what, and recently? Uh, between 2012 and 2014 repaired. So I want, I do, and again, it kind of, it post dates the switch in both cases. And let's look at this one. 2012, let's go. Yes, the North Jetty was um, finished in June of 14. Okay. The other one was finished in the Earlier, right? Earlier. The South Two years. was finished first. I live directly out from the, well, in from the South, and I watched it. I just moved there. No, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> always, always. It's guaranteed. And while you're looking for what you're looking for from uh, the Repair was June of 14, and in December of 14, we had lost 100 feet on the river side. And I believe now it's over 400. Wow. So just to, that's about 20, I'm being general, 2011, 2012, roughly. And you'll notice the switch seems to have occurred by that time already. You're already on the down, you're already starting the downward slide a little bit along Reservation Terrace, which is one of the, th I believe, again, I study, I've gone through this and studied this over and over and said, no, 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 it's got to be, it's got to be. It makes sense that it's, and yet it seems to predate and then get worse after. So it, I, think it's, I think that there is a natural migration of the erosion pathway within the jetty system that probably correlates to the same 25-ish year time frame that we're seeing on the front side that probably has to do with something we don't yet understand about the dynamics of the inlet that then is like, you, as soon as you close up that jetty, bam, it, it makes it that much worse. But yeah. isn't it more parsimonious to, to look that, that the jetties are the cause? It, it is, and that's certainly a, 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 a major contributor. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. yeah. Question back here. The um, very slight uptick on the red line of the reservation terrace, yeah. is that hopeful or an anomaly you will look over a couple of years? <laughs> It, it looks like we just I believe it was an anomaly because <laughs> as I recall that was so that's probably that's I, mm, I have to look at my day what month it was it was 2018 I know because I spent this time Christmas morning in fact making some of these figures last year trying to meet a deadline and we um, and so I know that that was a, that data is from 2018 and does not represent what's happened in the last year. Where my understanding is, it's it's gotten worse. So the next couple of years, we want to watch where that dot, where that line goes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. We're fortunate now in that we have more data to look at, so that we now have satellite data that is multiple times per year, so we can start to fill in more dots with that. Yeah, absolutely. This is story is not over yet. I had the same question. Okay. I had the same question as the other person. But um, I, I think that people who are saying there's not a correlation between the South Jetty and the erosion, I mean, I, I just think that's ridiculous. I 
mean, there's clearly a correlation between the erosion and the South gender. I, mean, I, I just think that's, I mean, I've watched it over the last 10 years. Yeah, and, yeah, and I, I cannot, will not defend or speak to further the the Army Corps' report on that and what they came out with, though it is publicly available. It, it, the, the, the Army Corps, um, the Army Corps is on the hook for $10 million if it's proved that the, that the jetty caused it. So there's a reason their DOT study, uh, it, I see. they used a little bit of cherry picking um, and yeah, to, I, guess. To, I mean, it's more, it's more a political and a legal document yep. than it is a scientific <laughs> document. Yeah. Has, have you done any modeling at all that would I shall give you the address of the National Science Foundation, to whom I have applied multiple times for grants to do just that, in fact. Um, we seriously, I mean, I'm not kidding. We have actually literally applied with the same group of people who have gone back twice, and they've been like, that's a great idea. Now, um, and this is, yeah, they, th this is, if you want to, this is funded by the National Science Foundation on one project. There's a 10% chance of any one project that we propose being funded. Right? Um, that was one that we proposed twice, and apparently 0% chance of those two times. But on, you know, that's, that's on me as a scientist, and we're, we're going to probably try to go back on that. But that's one of the things you want to see, and what happens if there's a big pulse. Let's say we take out two of the big dams at once. Boom. And we let all the sand come down. How much does that fill up the area? How much does the beach grow? How many years of sand are trapped behind those dams? I do not have that answer, but we wanted it. And we, we, back of the envelope says that there's actually probably uh, at least 100 years of normal sand. That was our back of the envelope for the proposal. We didn't actually get to go out and map and measure, but at least 100 years worth of normal sand behind those. Wow. Wow. So that would be a fantastic thing to look at. Um, and we know, so there's a spot out on the west coast in Oregon where they've done just this. They have, there's been a large scale dam removal. The beach has grown by hundreds of yards, almost overnight. There's a whole new beach area, a little delta has formed. It is beautiful, it's now bird nesting. It's, it's this very wide beach, why one dam? Now of course that's a much steeper river with a lot more sand in it. But that's the same kind of thing that is now being considered very seriously as so many of the dams along at least East Coast and New England rivers are filled, 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 filled. There, are, there, there is so much sand and mud trap behind them that water just flows over and they're not serving much of that purpose anymore. They're very shallow back there. So we'd love to see what that is. And there are questions, of course, about... Uh, so not to make it sound like sediment's all good, let's be clear about sediment for a minute here. What are those dams associated with? Mills, industry, so think about what's in that sediment for a moment here yeah. as well. <laughs> so that, but that's one of the other considerations we wanted to, you know, from a geochemical perspective. So yeah, it's, it's a great question because we are, it, it's something, it's kind of the next step to this thought. Right now, we're dealing with, we're working with whatever comes out of that river every year, and some of what's dredged out, right? And that's what we have to work with, and yet, it's a big river system. So, yeah, good question. So we have uh, one up front. I don't know where the yeah, mic is. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I, I need the mic. I'm, I'm trying to get you a mic. Oh, I can talk loud. <laughs> Make it easy for yourself and everybody else. Here we go. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Norman Tully, and I've lived on the Plum Island for about 42 years. Wow. I'm on 64th Street. Can I go to the whole thing? Can you hear me? No. Here we go. Can you hear me now? No. Yeah. Okay. Hold it straight out. Just okay. <laughs> more advice. <laughs> Good? No? Come on up to the front. Come on up here. Let's go. Bring them on up. Let's do this. There you go. There it is. I want to say hi to you anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, here you go. I'll ask you one question. Sure. First of all, right away, would you buy a house on Plum Island? <laughs> <laughs> No, I, My wife's in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't go for 
presentation like this probably four or five years ago, I guess, wasn't it, maybe six? Yeah. And they Probably said, there's a lot of sand out front. So a couple of I was set up out front. And he says, maybe within a couple of years, it'll be here, it's coming in. I said, well, I can hardly wait. <laughs> That's not how I said it, a little bit different, but I said, I can wait, <laughs> anyways. But I go to Florida in the uh, winter time. I should be there now, but I'm not. I stayed here for you. But yeah. <laughs> wow. But no pressure. There would be no Florida because there's a lot of beach erosion down there, and they refurbish the bit, the beach. Yeah. Every about every ten years, it's in the budget. So why can't we pump some of that sand from out front and pump it in onto our beaches here? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, on that last question there, the engineering and societal question, I think that's exactly it. That's one of the examples of, of where we could, you know, sand is like many other things, like the oil that's, you know, down the line, in part causing some of this, right? It's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a resource, it's a, and it's one that is limited out there. However, there is sand offshore. In fact, my first thing I ever did was spent two weeks on a boat going back and we call it mowing the lawn. It's as exciting as it sounds. We spent two weeks on a boat back along the lawn and back up all offshore and back and back. Um, mapping the bottom, looking for sand and gravel resources, funded at that time by the Minerals Management Service, what's now BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and that was exactly the kind of thing that we we're looking at. Uh, it's a great report, U.S. Geological Survey, 2009, that documents all those sand resources offshore. They are there, that is true. And there's also sand in the inlet, and that inlet is dredged, and that, but here's the problem, or the one of several, one, it costs money. Of course, so do the rocks. Right? So everything costs money. Societal question. Who's paying for it? Whose resource is it? Who's willing to pay? Am I, as a federal taxpayer in Virginia, willing to pay? Do we all not pay some degree for some federal projects throughout the country? We do, in fact. Should somebody on the Cape <coughs> pay uh, through their state dollars, their Commonwealth dollars? Right? Um, these are societal questions, not scientific questions. The other problem, though, is that that's great. This year we're going to go, we will take that sand, we'll move it on shore. And then next time we need to do it, it's deeper. Now we need more, more pipe. So it's a little more expensive to do it the next time. Fine, not so much, five years later. And I guess it comes back to your first question. Would I buy a home on Plum Island or any barrier island? Right now, I, no, I know you would, but I think it's a serious question and a fair one to ask a coastal scientist, a coastal geologist as myself. And the answer is, I love me. I grew up on Long Island, <clears throat> hence the accent. And, and you know, we would go to Robert Moses Beach, Jones Beach, you know, Fire Island beaches every summer, spend a ton of time there, loved it. And, and I, you know, I've been to the Fire Island communities and see the challenges there, and frankly, I feel like I have an, enough worries in my life that erosion is not one that I personally want. And that's more, more the thing. This is, so I think long term, there's different time scales. I talk about 4,000 years. I talk about 100 years. I talk about 25 year cycles. And I think that that's maybe what we need to be doing, this discussion should be, is not thousand years and even though everything you hear in the news about what's sea level going to be in 2100 what's sea level going to be in 2030 it used to be 2020 we could talk about now. what's sea level going to be in 2030 and and eventually Plum Island because sea level is rising and is rising faster than it was 4,000 years ago when it formed, or even 150 years ago when it was de the first development began, well, eventually it will shift. That is in the future. It's not in the 10-year future. It is not. Plum Island will be here looking almost exactly like it does 10 years from now, right? No matter what, almost. Uh, but sea levels are rising ever faster. The storms, probably nor'easters, definitely hurricanes are getting more intense. That, over that time scale, maybe when I start to think about the time scale of a mortgage, I'm gonna question, and the question is a little bit different than the time scale of, of a 10 year 
you know, can I hold on here? And there's a lot of really good debate going on, I think, out there now, up and down the coast. Believe me, we have it in Virginia as well. The Outer Banks certainly is constant topic of debate, is just that question. And what should we be doing? And one of the best ideas I've heard, in fact, pitched by one of the people, and you know, again, throw it out there to the conversation, pitched by one of my colleagues on this project, was the idea of, of a buyback government, yes, government buyback, but a rent. So I live on the beach, my house is threatened. This is more a discussion on the Outer Banks than Plum Island right now, my house is threatened. Buy it, let me rent it from you until the day when it's no longer stable, when it needs some structural repair that it, or else it's gonna be lost. I've gotten that many more years out of it and I've already gotten my investment back and I've given some of the taxpayer money back. These are some of the things that you're starting to hear in the scientific community, considering options over that 50-year time scale or 30-year time scale. Uh, testing, is it working? Yeah. You're good. Uh, it's a scientific question about modeling. When I looked at the Army feasibility studies on the jetty, they all go out six months. Not sure why. Your modeling goes out 20, 25 years. What's different? And the second part of it is, is it good enough to predict any one of those 25-year cycles that you put up with data on the board? Yeah, yeah models, uh, we, right. Thus, those of us who go out and collect sand for a living always joke about the models get garbage in and garbage out if you're not collecting good data out there. And you know, what's the time period you want? Uh, it's, a great, it's, it's, it's a great question. What, the way we run our models is not actually, it's, it's not a model that changes the morphology. It's not something that changes what the island looks like. It's shaped through time. What we do is we run what I think of as a day in the life. Here's the inlet. We're going to set it up, and we're going to hit it with a bunch of storms and quiet water conditions and see which way waves and tides and sediment are moving through that time. Then we're going to change the configuration ourselves and rerun it and run another day in the life of a different one. So it's not so much looking out over those time periods, but it's using the science, using our understanding of how the system works to come up with scenarios of what this looks like. So what we did was we took that inlet ebb delta and that bar and we forcibly changed the bathymetry offshore in the model and said, all right, we see this in the history, we see this in our field data. Let's now make the model such that the opening is down here and let's run it for one day or however many tidal cycles. And let's move it again, change everything again and run it again and see what happens. So it's a day in the life. It's, this is what this thing looks like under these conditions, rather than actually watching that thing move through time. We don't actually try to play that game because I don't think that you could try, there's too many, the small errors add up once you start to try to play out that. And you have to, in order to account for that, what you do is you simplify the system. You make it, plumb on, next thing you know, it looks like a rectangle and as you simplify these boxes to make it so that you don't have errors that run away. So this is our approach, which I think allows us to test our hypothesis, to test the idea that it's this gap and the ebb delta growth that we see and show, yep, this is where the, yep, this is where it's moving, yep, and, and do it that way. So that's why I'd say I have very high confidence in our models for that purpose, uh, but I, would, I don't use them as a predictive tool for that reason. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. I think, um, Mr. Sargent, you said that before the jetties were repaired, it allowed sand to get through the old jetty, which allowed the plumbers to the sand in the mouth of the river, correct? Right, yeah. But why, when they built the jetty, don't they have designs that allow sand to purposely go through them and they control by whatever mechanism to allow sand to get shut off? Yes, yeah, so the, the question there was about designs for the jetty. It was directed to, to Bill Sargent, not to me, but uh, it's about designs of the jetty that could better allow sand to move through that jetty and whether those were considered or are being considered at all. And Bill, I'll let you take that because I don't know the answer to that. My, should I go up? Yeah. Uh, well, my understanding on that was that it was a matter of time. Uh, and if it would take them, it would have taken them a couple of, the Army Corps of Engineers has often been uh, described as a slow-moving dinosaur, and I think we've seen that. 
if they if they change the the uh, the design on that, it would have taken several more years. So they simply use the design that they had off the shelf. Uh, but you're right; they should have designed a a, a, a weir jetty. Uh, what we have now basically is a weir jetty because the, it has settled enough. It's settled about three feet. So that area, that 50 foot area, is now below uh, what the jetty was before it was rebuilt. Um, so you're getting virtually all the sand is now is now going through there. Um, but it, why why isn't it going into the river mouth and up for preservation? But because from from just what uh, Chris was saying, you have the, the waves come in when the waves go through a, a, an aperture. Thirty five. They yes. Okay. <laughs> Working on it. All right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Right. So, so when the waves go through the between the jetties, then they spread out. So that energy, <laughs> yeah, the energy goes along the along the both sides, <laughs> and that and that keeps that that new beach. Uh, and it it only takes about uh, three weeks for that sand to move from where it's going through to get down uh, in front of, of of Northern Reservation Terrace. All right, so backing it up there, yeah. still nothing to stop it along there. Right. For now. Yeah. yeah. For now. But I don't understand the old gym. That beach sand was almost out in the middle of the river. It was, it was enormous amounts of sand in there. And it's gone. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's that. Can I add something to Yeah. Well, you're going to answer the mic so everybody can hear. Yeah, and we'll probably want to let people not have to sneak out. It's it's eight thirty, so right, I'm fine. But I grew up in a town. I grew up in a town with water. Um, Sixty years ago, they put in five jetties. That's Winthrop, Massachusetts. And if you visit Winthrop today, the beach looks the same as it did over sixty years ago because the jetties are filtered. They're rocks. I remember as a child climbing on those rocks. The, our solid jetty, and as my husband is saying, it doesn't seem to make sense to a layperson if the water can't get through and the sand can't get through. The ocean is smart. It's going to take that sand away. No one's mentioned this evening the dredging. If anyone remembers the large dredging project, it was about 16 years ago. It was out, um, and you were a great fan of white, by the way, up there. My pleasure. Um, but if you Need more help? says diffracted waves. Yep. There was a dredging yeah. project about 16 yeah. years ago, and that's what caused the law, in my opinion. The sand came off the beach, because we live at 59th Street. It went and disappeared to fill in the dredging hole, and then they did this jetty, and now we see the problem that's happening on reservoir. So I think, um, I'd like to acknowledge the mayor of the city councilors that are here this evening, by the way. Oh, I guess they're not here, but <laughs> very good. Letting okay. so, is there. Um, I hope that they get to hear or see or have a video of this lecture. It was excellent. Thank you. But I think that the question is really the Corps of Engineers and a solid jetty seems to be the issue. That's right. And I'll just say uh, Sandwich is facing exactly the same yes. thing because of the jetties that are, uh, you know, keeping the, the uh, Cape Cod Canal open uh, have created erosion in exactly the same way. They have gone through the DOTS process and are trying to get the $10 million. There's, a, there's actually a fund, a $10 million fund that's available if you can prove that something like a jetty has caused the problem there's a $10 million fund to change the jetty. Nature has already done that for us, so. Bill, this might, be the ten, this might be the $10 million solution then because everyone keeps talking about how the jetty is not allowing sand to migrate to Reservation Terrace. But that was done with trucks a year ago. The sand was brought in, and where's that sand now? It's gone. There's something else that was done at the time the jetties were built. The def where it says diffracted waves, mm -hmm. that's not accurate when it hits the beach. When it hits the beach, right by the letter S, there's another groin. And the, and the water that's comes an not the from the east, but from the north. As the waves come in and the energy is lost on that, uh, on that wing wall, which was added to at the time mm -hmm. that the jetty was built, 
the waves swing around it yeah. and they come from the north and you get backshore scourings. You can yeah. stand there on a falling tide and watch yeah. the sand get scooped away from reservation terrace. Yeah. I, so I, I think it's been proven, A, yeah. that placing sand on reservation terrace isn't the solution, so therefore the hole in the jetty couldn't be the cause, and B, and nobody's really addressed the additional stone that was placed on that wing wall at the time that the jetty was built because that wing wall traced the face of the dune at the time that that was complete. Yeah. I, I think what you're talking about is the spur on the jetty. You can and, see it right there. Yeah, the and, and the spur, the spur was really was built because of the erosion that the, 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 the uh, uh, Coast Guard, the old Coast Guard station was gonna, gonna it was fall added in the drain. Recently. So they so they built that and you're at, and you're right. What happens when those diffracted waves come in, it's almost like cracking the whip. They they whip around and you'll notice that, that actually the spur is getting buried again uh, from from the from the shore side. So there's about four feet of sand. Uh, and eventually it, it will it will get buried again and that will be under sand. So, and I, I think probably what we, you know, <laughs> Chris is probably getting tired and it's way past my bedtime. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I think, why don't, should we take one more question? If people want to come up and talk informally, we can, we can do that. How about this? You take your question, but you can't use the word jetty. <laughs> What? Virginia? That, Virginia that, barriers? That will end it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody else to learn? All right. In that case, let me just once again say thank you all. Thank you to Storm Surge, Bill, Mike Morris, Sheila for inviting me, having me here. I really appreciate it. Sheila.